Welcome all you conspiracy heads to another episode of Zach Somnia. I'm of course your host, Zach Ray, and I ask you the question, what keeps you up at night? <laughs> all right, I'm getting away from my spooky voice. Um, I came across this video uh, today, and it's a video um, from rather recent actually this was from uh, last month I believe uh, it's from uh, channel Astrolux 777 and the video is entitled uh, UFO cover-ups 1980 original Roswell proof plus hangar 18 and project blue book uh, now if you are a conspiracy nut like me um, the incident that happened in Roswell, New Mexico is something that is incredibly interesting to look into. Now, I'm not like one of those conspiracy theorists like Alex Jones, who's just like, oh, everything's real. <laughs> but the thing is, is that I do feel like there are a lot of things that you can question uh, and a lot of things that are a little hairy. And there are a lot of situations that have happened throughout history that have been awkwardly, I don't want to say covered up, but awkwardly covered in general, um, and just doesn't seem quite honest. So I'm going to start with this video, and then I do have an article that I do want to go over from uh, BBC Sky at Night. So we're going to start off with this video uh, from 1980, which you've already got me, because if you show me anything from the 80s, like, I'm immediately drawn to it, because I just love, like, the artistic nature and kind of, like, what... What, what, what type of, of video footage they were putting out in the 80s, what type of shows were in existence. Like, I just like the, the architecture of how a lot of projects that came out in the 80s look. I like the vibe. I love the vintage feel. So, let's take a dive and see just how much this story is going to keep me up tonight. <laughs> I'm already sufficiently creeped out. <laughs> this is the clearest film ever shot of a real unidentified flying object. Okay. 68,000 UFO reports have been filed in this country alone. Skeptics, however, pose an important question. If flying saucers are so common, why haven't we captured one? It's a fair question. In remote New Mexico desert, but have, have we not captured one question. thus far? Is the real question. <gasps> Don't hurt the turtle. A persistent rumor holds that the United States government has recovered and is concealing fragments of alien spacecraft fragments, and more. <gasps> oh, top <it's> secret! This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose Leonard is to suggest Nimoy. some possible explanation. Is that who I'm but hearing? But not necessarily the only one. Oh, God damn. For the histories we will examine. Ooh, that's a creepy the UFO sound. The cover-up began almost with the first famous flying saucer sightings in late June 1947. It's curious. These reports seem to center around areas where atom bombs and rockets were tested. Were alien hmm. forces keeping watch on the new weapons we savages had invented? <laughs> we savages. Hey, at least he's honest. <laughs> the human race is pretty savage. Seemingly, our fastest jets could never come close to their incredible speeds and right angle turns. UFOs were said to be able to shut down guided missiles by remote control. The Air Force organized Project Blue Book to officially investigate UFOs. Since its termination in 1969, Blue Book has been alternately praised 
and damned. And why was Blue well, Book shut down? the position is that we investigated UFOs for 22 years, over 12,000 sightings. Colonel Don Burgrave, U.S. Air Force. About 95% of all the UFOs were explainable. They were weather phenomenon, they were balloons, they were airplanes, they were lightning. And we concluded as a result of our investigation, which was carried out very scientifically, that one, there was no threat to the security of the United States, and there was no evidence that we could ever locate that an extraterrestrial vehicle had landed here. But the New thing York is, if Peter there Gerson was a threat, the CIA and would FBI you bring it up and let the public UFO in on that information? Documents. The reading of all Probably the not. UFOs have the ability to render inoperable present-day technology. UFOs have the ability uh, to gain access uh, to our most sensitive military installations, unrestricted and unlimited access uh, to nuclear installations. There's no doubt about it in my mind that there's a government UFO cover-up. Ray Fowler, civilian UFO researcher for 17 years. I've talked to military people who have told me about government cover-ups, how they've been instructed to say this and to say that. And uh, Makes I sense that that would be something that would myself. happen. And, uh, because why would you want to freak out the world and I'm very familiar with, with the, the truth, I guess? And cover stories and things like that. I mean, I want to so know, no but I'm just one person. <laughs> there is a cover-up. If there was a planned cover-up, then uh, they were very successful in keeping it from me. Colonel Robert Friend, former head of Project Blue Book, Actually, now an engineer on the space shuttle. A lot of these organizations uh, decided that there was a cover-up because the Air Force didn't pursue these uh, sightings to what they considered uh, the ultimate conclusion. If there has been a UFO cover-up, it began in Roswell, New Mexico. Near White Sands and Alamogordo, Roswell was home base for many early tests of atom bombs and guided missiles. Here also, the practice of military stonewalling may have been perpetrated. The case began when Roswell businessman Dan Wilmot witnessed... <laughs> I don't want to be a dick, but he kind of looks town. like Megamind. His son tells the story. <laughs> this was their home in July of 1947. And one summer evening, they were sitting out here. Such Dad a modest-looking house for such an important figure. We saw an object that came down and had lights blinking, and it was rather frightening to him, but he said all of a sudden it seemed to rock a little bit and sort of counterbalanced itself wiggle a little bit, and then seem to settle down and take off at rapid rate of speed. The next day, reporters heard that the Air Force had found fragments of the mystery object crashed on a remote ranch northwest of Roswell. Excitement ran high. Who's until ranch? officials announced it was only a weather balloon. Major but Jesse of course Marcel, you're going to say that, though, the if operation, it is true. Now tells a far different story. They took pictures, of course. They had a whole flock of microphones there. They wanted me to, they wanted some comments from me, but I wasn't at liberty to do that. So all I could do We're was keep the mouth shut. Huh. And General Ramey is the one who discussed or uh, told the, the, the newspapers, I mean the newsman, what it was and to forget about it. It was nothing more than a weather well, observation balloon. Of course, which we, we both knew differently. Major but see, Marcel that's that's my some. thing. All right, I gotta pause it. See, that's my thing. It's just like I just have always had the question, you know, when speaking to people in my life that I know that are just like so against the idea that this is a reality, um, or that the reality of UFOs exists or aliens or and whatnot. My question is always, what do the people? that are coming out and, and speaking of their experience, what do they have to gain? What do they really have to gain? You know, like a lot of, a word that I, I hate that gets thrown around so much um, lately is clout, you know, and notoriety. And the truth of the matter is, is if you have somebody that has a truly horrific UFO-based experience and they come out and they talk about it, all they're really getting met with 
in mass majority is scrutiny and you know doxing of like their personal information their family's information you know just mass world revolving heckling and why would somebody want to subject themselves to just such negative energy coming from so many people if they're you know speaking their truth so I just have always just had that question. It's just like, what do these, these people have to gain? You know, they really don't have much to gain. And the thing is, it's like, I guess maybe now more so you can look at it as if somebody comes out, there'll be a larger group of people that will actually listen to them. Um, but I still think there would be more of a majority of people that just, well, you're just full of shit. You're just lying. You're just trying to get clout, whatever. Even if the story's true. But that's just because there's just there's just such an imbalance of information. And I just feel like if it is true, the government should just be upfront and honest about it. But then the alternative opinion to that, it's like, well, if they do, then is that something that would cause mass hysteria? Is that something that would really, really negatively affect... Uh, you know, culture and society as a whole, knowing that, you know, the government could have been lying to everyone all these years. And the fact that, you know, we possibly could be, you know, under attack by some unknown extraterrestrial entity, even though to this day, you know, nothing world the world's like has happened. It's just, there's just so many questions, and that's why this is just a story that's just so interesting to me, because there are so many questions. But again, I'm not somebody that's just gonna, like, you know, throw on my tinfoil hat, and, you know, and fucking look up at the skies, and just be, you know, uh, and be terrified. It's like, no, dude, like, this is just something that's just so profoundly interesting to me, because there just isn't much truth about it. And I guess me as someone who uh, is very much a truth seeker to certain things, it's just, it's just, it's incredibly interesting to me. You know, the concept of, of alien life. I think it's silly to think that our existence is the only possible existence that could be. I just think that's a very silly notion to believe. You know, I think it's very egotistical and I think it kind of it speaks a lot about the human race because I think the human race as a whole is, uh, you know, a gathering of consciousness that, you know, we are better. Um, and I think the, the truth of it is, is that, you know, we're, 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 we're not alone. We're not alone. Whether or not, you know, the existence of alien life uh, is kind of like, you know, circling the planet and visiting here to hurt harm or study us um i just i just think that it's it's kind of wild to to just think that we are the only thing that can exist uh in the universe i just think the universe is just so vast that it's just like you have to believe that something is out there you know and they're probably just observing us and and just <laughs> I don't know, figuring out why we're so destructive as a race. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I don't know. I have no idea. I've never spoke to an alien, so I have no idea. At that time, he was in charge of all security and intelligence on atomic tests in the United States and the Pacific. Marcel retraced his secret recovery operation across the hot New Mexico desert. We left the Roswell, perhaps around... 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon, as you can see, it's flat. It is very difficult. In fact, uh, with just verbal directions, uh, we never would have found it. We had to follow the rancher out there. The crash site was so remote, it took an entire day to drive there. The following morning, we went out to the site where the crash was. And uh, what I saw, I couldn't believe there was so much of it. It was scattered over such a vast area. So we proceeded to pick up as much of the debris as we could, loaded in the wagon. We filled that up. It took us a good part of the day to do that, because uh, there's such small fragments that we had to do a lot of picking. We found a piece of metal uh, about a foot, a foot and a half to two feet wide and about, about two or three feet long. It felt like you had nothing in your hands. It wasn't any thicker than 
the foil out of his pack of cigarettes. But the, the thing about it that got me is that you couldn't even bend it. You couldn't bend it. Even with a sledgehammer would bounce off of it. Really? So I knew that I had never seen anything like that before. And as of, as of now, I don't know what it was. There is new evidence that the FBI then got into the case with a different cover story. Lawyer Peter Gersten, searching through declassified government documents, came across a mention of the Roswell case. One of those documents related to an incident in Roswell, New Mexico, uh, which indicated that the object which had crashed was an experimental kite. Uh, the FBI investigated the incident and determined that it was terrestrial, that it was from uh, an organization which had been doing research in, in experimental kites. What did crash in this desert? <clears throat> but if it's a, a UFO, kite, then why is the metal balloon, you know, completely unable kite. to be damaged, it was not according to this guy? From this earth that I'm quite sure of. Because I was being an intelligence officer, I was familiar with just about every, all the materials used in aircraft and in our air travel. This is nothing like that. It could not be. It, it could not have been. To develop the first atomic bomb, the Manhattan Project was our first totally secret military operation. Secrecy has continued to this day as an instrument of foreign policy. Official fabrications have become a vital link in security. We never admitted such a spy plane as our U-2 existed until the Russians managed to shoot one from their looks skies. Cool. We managed to capture an advanced enemy aircraft even fragments can reveal new information. Such captured material is routinely rushed to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton to the top secret foreign technology division. This place is so classified that former Gosh, Air so Force wild General seeing all these Senator old Barry vehicles. Goldwater was once denied entrance. It reminds me of like the family cars that uh, my parents had years, when I was younger in the 90s. We still base. had cars According in the, the 90s story, from, the you know, the 80s and the 70s security. throughout the Flying years. Flying saucers from another world and alien bodies cryogenically suspended in human It's so freezer. wild to see him Such like this. Such could be easily dismissed. <laughs> Where are the ears, Except that Spock? UFO researchers have gathered information leaked from military sources. Sources who claim to have seen the craft and the bodies. The stories and rumors all mention a mysterious Hangar 18 as the ultimate repository. In search of cameras were the first allowed to photograph inside this hangar. Is it possible that here in Hangar 18, highly secret activities once took place? What awesome. evidence of a cover-up might we hope to find? Patterson is one of the largest and most complex air bases in the world. In the Foreign Technology Division alone, hundreds of secret experiments have been undertaken. Continuing military security has made Hangar 18 a mysterious citadel. Some experts believe that new designs have been created here. Every branch of the military has experimented what with flying wings, flying wings, flying wings, hovercraft, with an amazingly consistent lack of results. The flying saucer shape was an obsession of aeronautical pioneer Edmund Doak. These rare films show static and dynamic tests of his early models. Doak spent 30 years and a third of a million dollars investigating the problems of circular airfoils. Ironically, just when he seemed on the verge of a breakthrough with his Doak 16 vertical takeoff plane, the Air Force canceled development on his projects. No reason was ever given. Hmm. But it's clear that the they H2 were never F2 really able to replicate what was seen. As a prototype for the space shuttle. You know. As with all flying wedges, lack of stability was the single unsolvable problem. Able to confirm a single successful test of a manned flying saucer. Yet, 
The effort continues. Why? Does the government have some reason to pursue this quest? A reason they're keeping secret? Yeah, so they can finally From be when? like, Oh yeah, it's a been us all this time. Look at this. An eyewitness account <laughs> which could explain this continued military fascination with flying saucers. Ray Fowler, one of the most respected civilian UFO investigators, is also author of two bestsellers in the field. Because of his stint in the Air Force Security Service, he finds himself still vulnerable to government pressure. I work for a company that uh, designed and built a, a major weapon system. And because of connections within the company, because of connections with Dr. Jalen Hynek, who was an Air Force investigator for, for many years, uh, I came across information that indicated that this major weapon system, as well as others, had been disrupted by UFOs. And uh, I gave a story to a national newspaper, the Christian Science Monitor, uh, which published the story. Uh, within an hour after this particular paper was out, the Strategic Air Command had called my company. And the following day, the Pentagon called the company and threatened to send a letter of displeasure to the company if uh, something wasn't done about my uh, making these things public. See, that's a thing. That's because a question I have. It's like, what does he have to benefit coming out and saying that this is something that's happened? Years, you know what I'm an saying? Like, story. And what Ray even happened to him? That's another question I have. Like, <laughs> did this man was he able to live the rest of his life, or did he just disappear? <laughs> you know, who knows? The man finally agreed for the first time to talk, but only under strict conditions. Uh, I can assure you that uh, your name will not be used. They made up a name, Fritz, to protect the witness's true identity. And I think the best hmm. place to do it probably Fritz. would be my planetarium away from the kids and the telephone and things I like feel that. like I've heard that before. Waiting for his friend to arrive, Ray nervously fiddled with his telescopes. He remembered his extensive investigations into the man's reliability as a witness. In the case of Fritz, I started in... 1973, when all the way back to the various companies he worked for, right back to Ray Patterson Air Force Base, talked to people he worked with, and they all gave him a very clean build of health, a reputable man, honest man, not the type that would uh, fabricate a hoax, and a very efficient uh, engineer manager. As the man arrived, Ray recalled the years his friend had wavered about breaking an oath of secrecy. He recalled their long arguments about a greater public good. Would the years of patient persuasion at last pay off? So I understand it, Fritz. Uh, you were working for the United States Air Force. Uh... The story began late one night in 1953 at Frenchman's Flat, Nevada. The man had been working as a consultant on blast effects of atom bombs. The thing that gets me, though, is that, like, if you really are mission. trying to be anonymous, what happened after that? this silhouette... You really put on a, um... The people that know will know who you are. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, that's also something that I question. It's like, if you're going to be anonymous, why even show your silhouette, you know? If I knew you, I'd be like, oh, that's so-and-so. Get him. You know what I'm saying? We, at that time, came to the conclusion it was in the area of Kingman, Arizona. After getting off the bus and recreated here, the scientists were taken to an even more remote location. They had no idea exactly where they were or what they were about to see. We were told that we had been selected for various technical specialties. And I was told that I was to ask any questions that had to do with dynamic loads and nothing more. And I wouldn't be getting any answers to any other questions. It looked like two saucers, I would call it, uh, one on top of the other, inverted, probably 25 to 30 feet in diameter. In terms of something known, what kind of metal would it look like? Well, it would look like a brushed aluminum. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure it probably wasn't that I say that uh, because I noticed no scratch marks. Mm -hmm. And anything that would penetrate into the sand 20 inches that way would certainly have some scratch marks. No signs of buckling fracture or anything? Not that I could see. I accepted it was probably some United States government uh, vehicle, a uh, highly classified vehicle. In fact, we were told that But the only was. vehicle that wasn't able to enough, one of the questions I have to know damage upon the impact? The vehicle was. Well, I can tell a lot of things from the penetration into the desert sand and so forth, but I need to know the mass. 
and they told me that they weren't going to let me know that. I, I, they perhaps didn't even know themselves. That's probably more likely. Well, we can't tell you intent, because, well, which, we don't uh, know. <laughs> I didn't get to look into, but uh, one fellow whom I did happen to talk with briefly until they told us to stop talking uh, said that he had seen two bodies inside this tent, two alien-looking bodies. It was brown, leathery skin. I had a silver, like a cap on, without a bill. Like a skull cap? Yes, like a skull cap. I realized what this really started to mean, but I also at the same time realized probably why the government was keeping it classified. There were a lot of things that could uh, be changed. Yeah, keeping it classified because it's something that they don't understand. The so they can't like that, release that, that it time. and figure it out while the public is also figuring it out. So it would make like sense that it would be something that at the time this also they would want to keep craft taken to right real hush hush. Cameras are normally prohibited there, but in search of was allowed to photograph certain declassified areas. We found there actually are huge freezing chambers inside the legendary Hangar 18. The okay. only knowledge I have of Little Green Man, Martians, or whatever, would be from the articles I had read of some of the published uh, novels like Frank Scully's book and things like that. Don Ritter, building's manager since 1942, claims the giant freezing cells were never used for storage of alien bodies. Building 18 at well, what Patterson were they used for? was used primarily for cold soak engine testing. And we had four cells in this facility that we would uh, take down to minus 65 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, um, soak the engine for some period of time, and uh, make the engine starts to test components, engines, and whatever for cold starts. My major criticism is that uh, from way back in the 1947s, there should have been a gradual in information uh, release. And, uh, had the uh, public uh, accustomed to, to what UFOs are, what we're trying to do about them, uh, and it wouldn't be as big of a deal. They've covered up so long that to admit that they've covered it up, it's almost like another Watergate. It would be detrimental. Uh, plus Absolutely. The fact, uh, I, I get they don't what he's saying. Yeah. And if they admitted even what they knew, people would want to know more answers. They don't have the answers to give them. I'm sure they don't have the answers to give them. Based yeah. on my own personal that. and professional experiences. For the last 26 years of wearing this blue suit and most of that i've been in the public affairs business where i'm responsible for releasing information to the public i can assure you on behalf of the air force that there's just no truth to that at all mm, I, don't Inside the freezing yeah. chambers of <laughs> I don't believe 18, you why would you be truthful one small clue in the mystery you're still UFO wearing the suit so of course you're Whether you know going to say what they vision, what favors them for flying saucers has already profoundly influenced our perception of our place in the universe. 100%. Colonel Robert Friend, former head of Project Blue Book. I believe that speculation and a scientific approach to it can't live together. Uh, I would... Uh, Why not? ...feel that there were in a lot of instances isn't that the whole thing of scientific explanation is to question everything and find the answer we should have been pursued further and in that regard yes uh i think that some of the cases had a lot of promise the roswell case I felt like he was being very careful with what he was saying he was blinking a little too much dramatic examples mm -hmm. of close encounters of the fourth kind like the 68,000 reports on record of UFO sightings, they exist in a limbo, halfway between science and speculation. But the thing is, how can you scientifically explain something? How can you scientifically explain something that you can't? You know what I'm saying? I mean, if like if UFOs are a thing, and uh, you are discovering this object and this material that you can't penetrate you can't figure out so if you're not able to explain it like how does science play into that you know i mean i just i don't know i guess color me 
blissfully ignorant because I'm not obviously not involved in the field in any way. But I just think it's just kind of weird to be like, yeah, well, you know, there's a huge difference between speculation and science. It's like, well, in order to come to a scientific conclusion, you have to question and try to get to the root of it. And if you can't explain it scientifically, how does that immediately make it false? You know what I'm saying? It's just it's just weird. Anyway, we're going to move on from that and go to this article that I found from uh, BBC Sky at Night magazine. And this was actually written pretty recent. This is from June 22nd, uh, 2022. Uh, it was an article written by Nick Pope called What Really Happened in the Roswell UFO Incident? Did a UFO really crash land in Roswell, New Mexico? And what are the facts behind UFOlogy's most famous case? All right. July 2022 marks the 75th anniversary of the Roswell incident, where believers say an extraterrestrial spacecraft crashed in the New Mexico desert with debris and possibly alien bodies uh, being recovered by the U.S. government, marking the beginning of a decades-long cover-up. Uh, what really happened at Roswell, uh, and why does this mystery still attract such an interest and controversy decades later? Because we have no answers. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We have public accounts and we have the government saying everything's bullshit but we have like what over how, how many like sixty thousand or whatever the fuck they said accounts of people that witnessed it so it's like what's the truth you know what i'm saying so yeah of course there's just been no definity to any of it uh, all right the roswell story begins the Roswell incident begins on uh, June 24th, 1947, when pilot Kenneth Arnold was flying over the Cascade Mountains of Washington State in the U.S., helping to search for a crashed military aircraft. He saw nine uh, crescent-shaped objects flying in formation at a height of around uh, three kilometers, which is 10,000 feet, um, at an estimated speed of approximately uh, 1,900 kilometers uh, was it per hour. Uh, seemingly impossible at the time. Sorry, you have to excuse me. I'm an idiot when it comes to, like, these metrics and shit. Uh, Arnold described the jerky movement of the objects as being uh, like a saucer would if you skipped it over water. Uh, the media got hold of the story, coined the phrase flying saucer, and a modern mystery was born. Uh, this wasn't the first sighting of what we now call a UFO, you uh, unidentified flying object which I think they changed it. Oh, it was like UADs or something like that. Um, I forgot what the new term is, but they've they've changed it from UFO for whatever fucking reason. I have no idea. Um, maybe to be more cryptic <laughs> when they talk about things. I have no idea. Um, let me see. This wasn't the first sighting of what we now call a UFO, unidentified flying object, but it was the first. Uh, but it was the first to capture the public imagination, making news and headlines around the world. More reports were received, suggesting these sightings were commonplace, but had previously gone unreported. Uh, as this summer of the saucers progressed. Uh, media coverage intensified to a point of near hysteria until matters came to a head and it seemed the mystery might be resolved. See, and that's the thing. That's that. That's the only thing that I th that makes sense as to why you know if this is something that really truly did happen, it would explain why they wouldn't want to further elaborate on it because of the hysteria that uh, surrounded it at the time. And then, as that guy in the documentary said, you know, it's like we they've already gone all these years with speaking of it in a certain way that it's not true so to then come out and be like well <laughs> we've been lying all this time you know would not make them look good at all so they have to continue with you know the narrative obviously um debris discovered at roswell on uh, july 7th a local rancher named mac brazel contacted the sheriff in roswell to say he discovered strange debris spread over the ranch he'd found it days earlier but hadn't thought much of it until the stories about flying saucers emerged thinking there might be a connection and guessing something might have crashed during a recent storm he alerted the authorities. He brought some samples of the debris, and when the sheriff contacted nearby Army Air Base, intelligence officer Jesse Marcel went to the crash site with Brazel and recovered more debris. Uh, oh, okay, so courtesy uh, Fort Worth Star-Telegram Photograph Collection, Special Collection of the University of Texas. Okay, so is this the actual picture? Hold on. 
Jesse Marcel. Really? So I think maybe just by the look of it is why they would kind of be like, oh yeah, yeah, it's weather balloon testing, but we can't explain why it's so fucking fast <laughs> and can do all these weird things and totally outmatches our technology. <laughs> Uh, all right. Uh, the military base's public information officer, Walter Hout, worked with a local journalist to release a Newswire report about the event. The many rumors regarding the flying disc became a reality yesterday when the intelligence office of the 509th Bomb Group of the 8th Air Force, uh, Roswell Army Airfield, was fortunate enough to gain possession of a disc through the cooperation of one of the local ranchers and the sheriff's office of Chaves County. The flying object landed on a ranch near Roswell sometime last week. Not having phone facilities, the rancher stored the disc until such time as he was able to contact the sheriff's office, who in turn notified Major Jesse A. Marcel of the 509th Bomb Group Intelligence Office. Uh, action was immediately taken, and the disc was picked up at the rancher's home. It was inspected at the Roswell Army Airfield, and subsequently loaned by Major Marcel to higher headquarters. Uh, for why <laughs> is a question I would have, unless you felt that it was something that was out of possibility of uh, your technology at the time. Like, hey, this is weird. This is strange. This is, you know, unlike anything we've ever seen. Uh, and it wouldn't be something that our enemies would be in, uh, in possession of because we're smarter than them and we would have far more advanced technology. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. <laughs> this is why it's all a fucking conspiracy. Um, the news sent shockwaves around the world, but it's the iconic front page headline of the local Roswell, Roswell Daily Record that's best known. RAAF captures flying saucer on ranch in Ro Roswell region. Uh, no details of flying disc are received. Hmm. Roswell Hardware, man and wife report disc something. All right, I can't see the bottom. All right. So, yeah, that this was posted, was it July 9th, 1947, on the front page? Okay, interesting. Uh, U.S. military U-turn. Within 24 hours, there was a stunning development. In a complete reversal of their position regarding the Roswell debris discovery, the U.S. military said a mistake had been made and that the flying saucer was a crashed weather balloon. Convenient. Uh, the, you know, of course you have to combat, you know, what could be the truth of what was reported in the newspaper. Uh, with your own narrative, so you can control the narrative. Try to convince people that everything else is a lie. Sound familiar? <laughs> In 2022? Uh, the Roswell Daily Record printed a follow-up story that read, General Ramey empties Roswell saucer. Uh, General Roger Ramey being the commander of the 8th Air Force, to whose Fort Worth headquarters the debris had been flown. Uh, a series of photos were published showing Ramey, Marcel, and other military personnel holding some of the debris. Sure enough, it... Deb debris. <laughs> Listen to me reading words incorrectly. Debris. <laughs> sure enough, it looked pretty uninspiring and was entirely consistent with the tinfoil mentioned by the military in their explanation. Um, so then these could have been staged and not the real articles. Um, or articles of debris that were discovered. Let me see, what does it say under the picture? Uh, at Fort Worth Army Airfield on July 8th, 1947. Uh, Brigadier General Roger M. Ramey on the left. All right, kind of looks a little Hitlerish, but uh, just that's just me. Uh, and Colonel Thomas J. DuBose identify metallic fragments found at Roswell as pieces of a weather balloon. Okay, so if they're, mm, I don't know. See, now I'm, now I'm questioning everything, <laughs> as I have been my entire life. Uh, nowadays, with the 24-7 news cycle, internet, social media, and an activist community of UFO researchers, such a claim followed by such an about turn uh, would no doubt cause controversy and conspiracy theories on a massive scale. This is especially true, given that the 509th Bomb Group was the only atomic bomb-capable squadron anywhere in the world at the time. 
It's hard to imagine these elite personnel, many of whom were familiar with weather balloons, being fooled in this way. But post-war America was very different from today, and in that calmer, more trusting of authority era, the weather balloon explanation was almost universally believed. See? Because they already knew that they had people eating out of the palms of their hands. They're like, oh, we can just say this, and they'll believe it, and it'll be fine, and we'll continue, you know, doing our things behind closed doors. <laughs> I mean, it makes, uh, makes sense to me. Uh, while interest in flying saucers and UFOs went from strength to strength, Roswell disappeared from the narrative. Well, has disappeared from my narrative, I can tell you that. <laughs> Uh, let me see this picture uh, nuclear physicist Stanton T. Friedman giving a talk about UFOs in 2007 okay, okay. the story of the Roswell UFO crash was rediscovered in 1978 by nuclear uh, physicist turned ufologist Stanton T. Friedman who was tipped off that a retired military man had an interesting story to tell uh, none other than Jesse Marcel Marcel told Friedman the weather balloon explanation had been a cover story and that the photos had been staged. Well, look at that. There you go. That was that. That's what I'm saying. Like, it just the math wasn't mathing. OK, we're getting somewhere with weather balloon debris being substituted for the real wreckage. No surprise there. Uh, he claimed that everyone involved in the retrieval was clear. The object had indeed been an extraterrestrial spaceship. Over the next few years, researchers dug deep into the mystery, tracking down many of the key players, locating additional witnesses, and trying to piece together what happened. A number of retired military personnel who'd been based at Roswell corroborated some elements of the crash spacecraft narr narrative and added their own details. Skeptics, skeptics argued that they were simply telling the researchers what they wanted to hear, writing themselves into the story either as a prank or because they were seeking attention. Either way, books were written, documentaries, drama series, and a movie were made, and the idea of a UFO crash became so embedded in pop culture that even if people had no particular interest or belief in UFOs, there was a good chance they had heard of Roswell. Uh, Roswell incident in the 1990s. Oh, okay. So now we're we're getting more in my era of living. Uh, okay, so this is you know the warning sign that's apparently up at Area 51. Uh, the bottom of the picture reads: Area 51 is a secretive U.S. military facility that is subject of many alien conspiracy theories. Um, I, on the other hand, believe that you know since Area 51 is just like so well known and you know so what people kind of gravitate towards when they think about um ufos and aliens and things like that i think that if they were to be in possession of uh alien spacecrafts from you know back in the day and and or uh alien bodies um it wouldn't be at area 51 i think it would be at a completely different location because why would you keep all of these things at the very place that everyone thinks that they are i don't know that's just me by now, fact and fiction were getting blurred, and the narrative was incorporating other UFO conspiracies. It was claimed, for example, that the wreckage had been taken to Area 51, a remote facility in the Nevada desert where the U.S. developed and test flew aircraft like the U-2, the SR-71 Blackbird, and stealth fighters and bombers, uh, where attempts were made to reverse engineer the alien aircraft. Such stories would subsequently turn up as plots in movies like Independence Day and TV shows like The X-Files. In 1995, a video emerged purporting to show an alien autopsy, which it was implied was connected to Roswell. Now, if this fucking picture isn't creepy, it's probably fake, but <laughs> it's still creepy as fuck, okay? Still fucking terrifying. Uh, the failures, this uh, image is from the famous alien autopsy film released in 1995, was later confirmed as being a hoax. Okay, see, that makes sense. I'm like, yeah, it's probably fake, but... That doesn't mean that, you know, it still isn't a reality just because this is fake. You know what I'm saying? Um, the film was a fake, of course, but it generated international news with the hoax footage subsequently forming the basis of a comedy film starring TV presenters Ant and Deck. Okay, interesting. Uh, during the 1990s, the U.S. government succumbed to media and public pressure, launching their own retrospective investigation and publishing two reports, the first in 1994 and the second in 1997. The conclusion was that the culprit was indeed a high-altitude weather balloon, but that it had been carrying equipment designed to search the atmosphere for evidence of Soviet nuclear tests as part of something called Project Mogul. 
Skeptics say that the highly classified nature of this monitoring project explains any apparent oddities in the handling of the incident. Mm. Mm, I've got questions. Uh, I've got questions. Uh, it's even possible that the Flying Disc story was a local initiative designated to throw the media off the true story, with Higher Command subsequently overruling the plan and saying it was a weather balloon. The second government report, the release of which coincided with the 50th anniversary of the incident, was arguably guilty of over-egging the pudding. It's an interesting uh, phrase, I guess. <laughs> over-egging the pudding. Okay, so you're like watering it down. Okay, I guess that's, okay, I, I worked it out in my mind. Okay, oh, you're, you're watering it down, got it. Um, none of the original reports had mentioned alien bodies, and even Jesse Marcel denied the aspect of the story, which only emerged later. Uh, okay. Uh, but the United States Air Force felt that they had to address the issue and their convoluted theories suggested that people had conflated the 1970 or the 1947 crash with tests in the 1950s with an anthropomorphic crash test with anthropomorphic wait in which anthropomorphic crash test dummies had been dropped to test the, if, the efficacy of military parachutes. Even for neutral recipients, this was a stretch and was met with predictable derision. By this time, however, the story of Roswell had become UFO community's flagship case. Uh, yeah, understandably so. Uh, the city of Roswell had embraced its heritage. A UFO museum had been opened and annual events were held to mark the occasion. Roswell now has such a name recognition that several U.S. presidents have alluded to the UFO incident in speeches and interviews, usually making lighthearted quips, but sometimes seemingly playing it sufficiently straight to make people wonder. Yeah, no fucking kidding. Like Bill Clinton <laughs> talks about, yeah, I'm going to look into this shit, or however the fuck he worded it, and then never talked about it again. Weird. Weird. I don't think he was doing it for shits and giggles. I think he looked into it, and they're like, Motherfucker, you can't say shit. You know what I'm saying? So, mm, I don't know. I question everything. <laughs> Roswell in the present day. Fast forward to now. The topics of UFOs has been steadily transitioning from fringe to mainstream over the last few years. Yeah, no doubt about that. At least in the U.S. It's funny that I'm reading this from, you know, it's a U.K. magazine. <laughs> so it's like, well, it's not just in the U.S. The U.K. is kind of looking at us like, mm, y'all might know something more than you're leading on. Uh, this process started in December 2017 with two related scoops from the New York Times. Firstly, the revelation that the U.S. Navy had uh, videos of UFOs taken from some of its fast jets. And secondly, the existence of the Advanced Aerospace Threat Identification Program, also known as AATIP. Um, yeah, I remember this video. Let's just watch it just for context. Yeah, fucking drawing, bro. There's a whole fleet of them, look on the ASA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 miles to the west. Oh, they do. Film, uh, video film by a fighter jet shows an unknown... Oh, San Diego. The video from 2004 is released by the U.S. Department of Defense. That's not an LNS though, is it? It's not an LNS. Well, if there's a good thing, it's rotated. One of the pilots told U.S. media the object was not from this world. Oh uh, yeah, you betcha. You betcha it's not from this fucking world, dang it. The exact role of the AATIP is still the subject of dispute, but the Pentagon confirmed that it did, in part, study UFO data. This is significant because previously the U.S. government said the official interest in the topic ceased at the end of 1969. Mm, lies! Uh, when the old Air Force program, Project Blue Book, had been terminated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, <laughs> sure. Uh, that may have been terminated because then it was masked and, you know, renamed into something else. Just like now they've renamed the term UFO. And it's like they're no longer referring it to UFO. They're no longer referring to the unidentified flying objects as UFOs. Um, let me see. The New York Times story was seized upon by Congress and classified briefings followed with a number of high-profile politicians, Republicans, and Democrats alike speaking out on the issue. 
summer of 2021, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence published an inclusive, inconclusive preliminary assessment that stated most of the sightings studied remained unexplained. Yeah, because how can you explain it? You don't have the UFO just fucking coming down, chilling and telling you everything. <laughs> no kidding. Uh, more recently, multiple UFO-related provisions were included in the defense bill, requiring the Department of Defense, the military, and the intelligence community to work together to resolve the mystery. You're never going to resolve it unless aliens actually come here and do some shit. <laughs> uh, this picture represents the U.S. Deputy Director of Naval Intelligence, Scott Bray, on the left, um, and under uh, Secretary of Defense for Intelligence and Security, Ronald Moultrie, which is on the right. Um, testify before a House Intelligence Committee subcommittee uh, hearing on UFOs at the U.S. Capitol on May 17, 2022. Fuck, so just like really recent. Okay. Jeez, see, see, it's still very fucking prevalent in today's society. There's, it, 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 I mean, come on, like what more do you need to be shown for it to be so fucking clear that this is a reality? If this is still such a talking point for them now in 2022 from back then in like the fucking 40s and 50s and shit, that means there's something there. At least that's, you know, that's that's the conclusion that I come to, because if it was a big nothing, then why would there be whole divisions of people trying to work through a mystery that they, you know, that they're trying to explain so hard <laughs> and not just, you know continue with the whole weather balloon explanation um congress wants to know if, the, uh, if these uh, mystery objects are drones operated by an adversary such as russia or china or something else um i feel like if that was the thing then we would also have that technology and would be better able to explain to the public what it what the phenomena is you know what i'm saying so that's why i'm just kind of like mm, that's just more of you just trying to be like well it could be this but it's like okay then why don't, don't you have the technology why can't you replicate <clears throat> um seemingly nothing has been taken off the table uh and this has sent the ufo community into a predictable frenzy yeah because we're like ah oh, we've been right all this time uh, all this means that the 75th anniversary of the roswell incident is significant yeah you betcha uh, it isn't just an opportunity for the local community to put on its usual parade and conference. Rather, Roswell is in the spotlight again, representing a sort of ground zero of the UFO phenomena. As the, events, uh, as the event passes from living memory into history, we may never resolve the mystery, but the story speaks to our wider fascination with one of the biggest and most profound questions we can ask. Whether or not we are alone in the universe big question it's a big question and i think it's a question that we may never get an answer to but uh, i'm still gonna look into the information as much as possible anyway thank you guys so much for enjoying me or enjoying me <laughs> ignore me i'm delirious thank you so much for joining me on another wednesday episode of zach somnia let me know down in the comments below what you think of all of these shenanigans involving the roswell incident have you had any ufo experiences i've had a couple experiences where i can probably say mm, mm, probably was a ufo maybe i'll talk about that in another video but anyway one last question i would like you to answer what keeps you up at night? <laughs>